Receiving a bunch of such content was the initial impetus for the question of how a woman is actually defined as half of humanity in interaction with today's rapidly evolving world. At all, is there anything to worry about or something to be modified to put women in a better position considering this modern world? In this video, we are going to explore if women can be more vulnerable in the society than men, if yes, how and why, and think together about what can be done to improve the situation. Let's take a broader look at the topic to see what can be understood from different aspects. Women are more involved in society compared to the past several centuries. It wasn't easy for them to get to this point from being workers in textile factories and in the mines during the industrial revolution to education rights to women's suffrage. But apparently, they are paying a high price for this presence. Let's go through some related aspects. At the end of the video, we complete this conclusion and ask for your opinion. First off, in most cases, men are the primarily decision makers in public policy. This is different from being a decision maker for a smaller groups like a family or a hiking team. The smaller a group is, the more likely it is to consider the benefits of all members. In other words, it's easier to collect data from smaller groups. Have you ever noticed the pattern of snow plowing in winter? First, the street will be cleared of snow, and if the accumulated snow has not covered the sidewalk so far, their cleaning will be the second priority. This pattern usually works against women by increasing the likelihood of sleep injuries in women. The studies show that women have a more complex daily travel pattern than men, in the sense that men's travel pattern is more commuting between two points A and B, for example commuting between home and work. In contrast, women's travel patterns may include several intermediate destinations, such as children's schools, stores, friends and relatives places, all adding more walking to their daily commute. The problem here is that non-inclusive decision making is all too common. All male teams make about 38% of decisions in large companies. This could lead us to a possible reason why women's behavioral data had less chance of being noticed by municipal decision makers. This is why research shows, compared to individual decision makers, all male teams make better business decisions 58% of the time, while gender diverse teams do so 73% of the time. Let's take a look at some engineering designs. Building industrial standards continue to suffer from lack of data on female occupants. Some of them are as follows. Indoor temperature is usually adjusted based on male body type. And women are likely to feel cold, especially in a workplace traditionally designed for men. The weight of the doors, the number and size of toilets, and many other elements, especially in public constructions are generally based on male data in the design. It's to do with male bias in toilet design. So you might think that it would be equitable and fair to have 50-50 floor space for men and women. Just that, it's also that women take longer, 2.3 times longer um, than men for a variety of reasons. It'll be things like more complicated clothing, it'll be things like, you know, we have to actually take our clothing off and get down on the loo. Um, women are also more likely to be with children or with elderly people or with disabled people. They're also more likely... The situation in the auto industry is not much better. Cars are still less compatible with the female body. From the size and design of the interior equipment to the safety taste, everything is largely based on the dummy of an average size man. Male and female differences in average height, bone density, fat to muscle ratio, etc. are all important factors that can make significant changes in engineering calculations in the final product. Even in some cases, the artificial intelligence of auto drives is trained by male voice tone. What's the weather in Berlin? The weather is 37 degrees and partly cloudy in Berlin. So we can say that the whole car is set up for women to be out of position drives. At best, all of this makes cars less feminine friendly products 
and at worst, women are 47% more likely to be seriously injured and 17% more likely to die in car crashes and study shows. Caroline Correa de Perez says in her book Invisible Women, Women are not lucky in public transport either. In London, a fifth of women have been sexually assaulted on buses and subways. And this is in addition to the fact that the public transport is really not designed to accommodate women's care works. It isn't really designed in a way that accounts for women's care work and that's partly because of how we collect data. So we collect data on paid employment and educational purposes as two blocks. So they come out as huge amounts of travel that is done and those are called compulsory mobility. But the kind of trips that women have to do in addition to their paid work, taking the kids to school, taking an elderly relative to work, picking up the groceries, you know, all the things that actually happen. We can go on with many engineering designs in technologies such as smartphones and other gadgets that do not primarily consider female data in their design, but it is enough to convey the whole idea in engineering. Last but not least, medical science and the pharmaceutical industry have also suffered from a lack of female gender data. Although these days new regulations are changing the trend, Historically, men have been the most preferred candidates for medical examinations. Again, the result could have been biased by the data. Because differences in the immune system, metabolic rate and digestion rate by gender could skew the effect of the given amount of the medicine. Far beyond these examples in engineering and medicine, criticisms like this really ring the bell to take a look at the issue at a very fundamental level, the place and role of women in society. It seems that in many cases women's data have not been comprehensively studied, or in some cases they have been studied but are used in a manipulative way. Apparently, what we have done in practice in recent centuries is to present or perhaps engineer an image of modern women based on criteria derived from the masculinity characteristics and urgent needs of booming economic development and then impose it on the image of a modern woman under the pretense of gender equality. The social scale discipline with the women's data gap can have more painful and damaging results not only for women but for the entire human society in the long run. Society is telling women they should want to be CEOs and run their own businesses to be in all the STEM jobs that are male dominated. Pregnancy and children are things to be feared or hinder them from accomplishment. We are normalizing hooks up, parties, sex with strangers, killing our offsprings and all the while telling women it's liberating and empowering feel pleasure and don't worry about consequences. Don't worry about the consequences. We may not worry about the short-term consequences, but the data that we extract from humans as part of nature, if ignored, can lead us in the long run to societal level catastrophes compared to the global warming crisis, which is also the result of neglecting environmental data and late actions. If you are wondering if unregulated sexual behavior could have led to the disaster, a study suggested it may have contributed to the Neanderthal extinction in at least one way, in breeding. We may not expect actual extinction, but the populations of less traditional societies are at least at risk of significant negative growth. However, we note that before making a firm judgment about this hypothesis, the correlation needs to be measured. We see that on the other hand, in some ideological societies it is tried to preserve the culture from the objectification of women with repressive measures, but at a high cost to women. From preventing women from getting an education or restricting the presence of women in society to determining a compulsory public dress for them. This phenomenon, however, can be considered as an extreme reaction to the objectification of women by ignoring women's rights and disrupting the health of society.
Again, as with any man-made disaster, a minority of beneficiaries will drive short-term benefits from such disruptions on a social scale, reflecting the main strain on the whole society. We could go on forever exploring different aspects, but let's see what causes this effect. Is there an intention to neglect the important data of women as half of humanity? Well, not necessarily. At least in many cases, especially in engineering and medicine, there should be no intention. As Caroline Crader Press explains, it's simply because men are treated as the default and women as atypical, bias and discrimination are baked into our systems. True, many data do not take gender into account. However, we cannot deny the existence of any intention to manipulate society in favor of economic development, industrialization, globalization, and even personal or group interests that can deliberately target and endanger the feminine side of society. A famous example of mind manipulation against women can be Torches of Freedom, which was used to promote female smoking by branding cigarettes. Sonia Suarez in her review of objectification on social media says Social media delivers messages straight to our phones, establishing a direct line of communication with influencers and cultural figures who teach that objectification is empowerment, that hypersexuality is liberation, and this is constantly reinforced. But is this really like this when the value of women lies mainly in their sexual potential? and in others recognizing it through likes. So in media theory, we have a concept called the reader inscribed in the text. So look at this woman. Look at her clothes. Look at her face. Look at her posture. And look at her gaze, G-A-Z-E. Now, who is she speaking to? Because the notion is, is that every image has a reader in man. Before you answer, do you think she's speaking to her mother, saying, let's go for a cup of coffee after the photo shoot? <laughs> so who's she talking to? Who's she speaking to? Men. She continues, a patriarchal system not only imposes stereotypes of beauty and behavior on us, but conditions us to internalize the message that it is really us who wants those standards. Though we believe we have complete freedom in choosing what we post, Ultimately, the approval from others drives our motivations to post content catered towards their needs, not necessarily our own. So let's wander through the images that these young women and men live in. Let's just think about the images that bombard them. And what do you want from a teenager when built into the DNA of adolescence is the need to be visible? What do you want from her when her friends are walking around with low-slung jeans, a tramp stamp, with those midriffs showing? What do you want her to do? Because it is impossible to ask her to go for invisibility. So this is not a choice. This is being forced into a type of sexuality that she didn't invent, that she didn't decide because there are so few choices. We tame the power of nature for our benefits. Although in some cases we can harm nature, the consequences of which will not appear immediately, but gradually. Now the big question is whether sexual attraction as a natural mechanism developed for the well-being and survival of society, if used for commercial purposes, will ultimately benefit or endanger society as a whole. However, we must not forget that ultimately it's society itself that can allow these services and products to target natural mechanism and their mental and physical health in order to make a profit. How? By knowingly choosing or avoiding such products and services. 
To conclude this video, a significant population of women seems to be affected to some degree by these issues and they pay tremendous costs for this bias, in time, money and often with their lives. Now, if they don't want to choose to adapt or harmonize with the situation, what can they do to deal with this situation? As Gildine suggests, one effective way can be education. Education by education by education. We're going to use a public health approach. Just like we stop drinking and driving, you bring to the table all those... But the question is, what do we mean here by education? What should be included in it? And is this education consistent with women's data? And more importantly, resistant to manipulation? Now it's your turn. What do you think about this issue? Share your opinion in the comments or you can send it to us by email. Finally, we will end the video by answering the question at the beginning if you haven't found them so far.